founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and, and historian. It is Friday, May 20th, 2022. And I wanted to come on and take a few minutes to give you a brief uh, preview, an overview of a 10-week online class that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. All right, we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And you, if you listen to uh, my radio show, the African History Network show, you watch our broadcast here, you've heard me talk about it numerous times. So I'm gonna do a quick overview here. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, and uh, we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. It's a very visual class. Uh, and some of the slides I'm gonna show you here are actual slides from the class. So when we deal with uh, our history, we can't start our history in slavery. This is why we have to look at this history chronologically. And we have to uh, also deal with the African presence here in uh, the Americas dating back tens of thousands of years ago. So we can't start studying our history in slavery, even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study. We can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved. We have to understand the history chronologically. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Uh, who enter the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, from North Africa. They go through uh, Morocco uh, in 711 AD. And we have to look at this history chronologically and, and look at what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And then understand the transatlantic slave trade as well and separate fact from fiction. Okay, so this is a 10 week online class. And uh, you, you'll learn a lot in this 10-week uh, course. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived. They're recorded. You can go back and watch it any time, okay? So this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but also thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, of African people taking place. So, you know, you have the 1619 Project for the New York Times, Nicole Hannah-Jones. And I've talked about the 1619 Project uh, before. They have some good information in there, but there's some things that are problematic because they don't deal with the African presence dating back tens of thousands of years ago in the 1619 Project, okay? So uh, August 20th, uh, 2019 marked the 400th anniversary of the 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes who came into Point Comfort in Virginia on August 20th, 1619, in what would later be called the Colony of Virginia. And there were two pirate ships, English pirate ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer, and 20 and odd Africans on the White Lion were traded for food and water and, and supplies, okay? Now, this was known, uh, 2019 was known as the year of return as many African-Americans uh, reconnected to Africa and traveled to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America. They have been in the land we call the United States of America today we call the United States of America, been here in this landmass at least 51,700 years, at least 51,700 years. We did not come here originally conquered and, and shackled in chains and conquered by Europeans. This is one of the problems with the way the history of the transatlantic slave trade is taught, okay? So this is why you you know to understand the existence of something you must first understand the pre-existence of existence as one of my teachers professor kaba hiawatha kamene correctly teaches us if you watch the african history network show you know i recently interviewed him 
I interviewed him in the um, month of April. Okay, so all those shows are archived here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, or our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Also, download the iHeartRadio app, search for the African History Network show, or wherever you get your podcast from, search for the African History Network show because our audio podcasts are there as well. Okay, so um, one of the, so we deal with a number of different books. So we have over 50 articles that we look at in the, that we deal with in the class. There's uh, close to 200 slides, over 50 articles, the number of books that I use for reference. One of the books that I use is uh, from one of my friends, Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Docu Documented Evidence. The First, Amer First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. His book came out in 2011. And his book deals with, um, has 700 foot, 713 footnotes. His book thoroughly documents an African presence in North, Central, and South America. South America dating back at least 56,000 years ago. North America in the land we call United States of America at least 51,700 years ago. Now, there was new information that came out a few years ago. New York Times has an article about this that pushes the African presence in South America back at least 100,000 years ago. But these are the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from southern Africa. They go all around the world. The ancestors that I knew in the Twa. And they were also here in the land we call the United States. In um, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, Dr. David M. Hotep talks about Turtle Island, which is which was one of the ancient names for this landmass. So page 14 of his book, he deals with... Um, Evidence of an African presence 51,700 years ago in a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina, discovered by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Now, Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of uh, South Carolina. Uh, he's a white archaeologist, and a lot of his archaeological discoveries are being suppressed by the dominant archaeology establishment. So we, we deal in, in, in this class, we look at a number of different archaeological discoveries that are causing uh, archaeologists and scientists and paleontologists to rethink everything, okay, to rethink everything. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So on page 14 of his first book, his new book uh, came out in 2021 late 2021 uh the first americans were africans revised and expanded has about 200 additional pages of uh of research okay so that's available right now at amazon.com but they found artif artifacts architecture campsites carvings egyptian writings footprints and lava genetic m174 d haploid groups dealing with dna and genetics linguistics painting skull skeleton structures and tools 13 different types of evidence barely documenting an African presence in this country that we call the United States of America, dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, this was before any Native Americans came into existence, okay? This is not an attack on Native Americans, but you just have to understand African people were the first people on the face of this earth, and African people had already circumnavigated the globe. All right. So um, and this is one of the things that Dr. David M. Hotep told me is that you will never find art, uh, fossils or remains of Native Americans that are older than Homo sapiens. Because the people who we call Native Americans are the offspring of the intermixture of intermixture of intermixing of Africans who were already here and Asians who come to this land about around 3000 BC and the Africans and Asians intermix and their offspring are who we call Native Americans. And then when European settlers come here, colonizers, um, a lot of the Africans who are already here get reclassified as Native Americans. So 
when you look at the different species, Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis and Homo erectus, Homo habilis, different things like this, you'll see Africans, all different species. Native Americans, you're going to see Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens. You'll see modern man. This article right here is from November 18, 2004, ScienceDaily.com. This is about the discovery that Dr. Albert Goodyear made. It's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Uh, it's from ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have scientific discoveries, archaeological discoveries, things like this. The article is still there. You can research other sources for this archaeological discovery. Here's a summary from ScienceDaily.com about this discovery. It says radiocarbon tests of carbonized remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County, South Carolina, by archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear, indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Who were these humans? Who were these humans? These, these were the Khoisan. These were African people. Okay, so you could read that entire article if you want to. So when we look at the Khoisan, who are the Khoisan? In October 2012, genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans. The oldest ethnic group of modern, modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, here's a picture of two Khoisan women, Khoisan African women. The Khoisan were the short-statured Africans. The Khoisan lived mainly in Southern Africa, in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, hunters and gatherers, uh, the Sans people and keepers of livestock, the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds, the click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. Now, one, uh, a good source for, for this information is an article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, five ethnic groups that prove the few first humans were black. Five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black, okay? And then we deal with some different ancient Africans. We talk about the people of the Adam and Islands as well. We go through and look at this history and look at it as much as we can chronologically there's a timeline of history that we look at um this is a good interview here with dr david m hotel on wkrp in cincinnati channel 5 from 2011. one of the archaeological discoveries uh from 2010 they had a lot of people talking there was an article from the new york times that deals with this discovery on the greek island of crete on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. This is from February 15, 2010, New York Times. So on the Greek island of Crete, they found stone tools 
that date back at least 130,000 years ago. Okay, and we know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen uh, because scholars like Renoko Rashidi, we know who's an ancestor now, and Dr. Charles Finch and others have said that Homo sapiens are at least 300,000 years old as opposed to 75,000 or 100,000 years old. But this archaeological discovery here, there was excavations done over the course of two summers. And stone tools were found on the Greek island of Crete that date back at least 130,000 years ago, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Now, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the toolmakers must have arrived by boat. The toolmakers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years. Specialists in Stone Age archaeology say previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and probably Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Okay, so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older, older we get. So this archaeological discovery is causing them to have to rethink everything. They have to rethink uh, uh, maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. And they say, well, wait a second. You know, so they had to have sailed there uh, 130,000 years ago. Um, this discovery right here, this deals with, uh, now there's more than one lost city of Egypt because there was uh, information about a lost city of Egypt that dates back about 3,000 years ago uh, that came out in 2021. We deal with that in the class. But this discovery um, from 2013 deals with a lost city of Egypt called Tanis Heraklion that was just swallowed up into the sea, okay, into the ocean. Um, the sunken Egyptian city reveals 1,200 year old secrets. This is an article from Yahoo News, uh, April 30th, 2013. Sunken Egyptian city um, reveals 1,200 year old secrets. So they picked up this story from the Telegraph, which is a UK publication, a UK publication, okay, the Telegraph. The Telegraph reports that 150 feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir, they found 64 ships, 60 foot tall statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins, and smaller artifacts. Archaeologist Frank Gadillo estimates Tanis Heraklion was built around 8th century BC. Now, when you research this, Prior to this discovery, they just thought that Thomas, Thomas Racklion just existed on paper. They didn't have physical evidence that this city actually existed. And when you get into this research, you're going to find civilizations built on top of civilizations. In 2011, there were 17 pyramids found buried underneath, uh, underneath uh, Egypt, underneath Kemet, underneath Egypt. And in uh, at the time of the discovery, at least two of those pyramids were excavated and it was confirmed these were, these were actual pyramids. That was a huge discovery also. So these archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week. OK, literally, these archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week. And when these discoveries come out, they cause all the scientists and paleontologists and archaeologists to rethink everything and push the timelines back okay so these are just a few of the things that we deal with in this online class and we deal with is visual these are actually actually some of the slides from the course the 10-week online course that i teach we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place these are some of the um uh pictures of what was found underneath the sea okay 
Um, if we go here and look at, uh, so th there was this discovery here, the father of humankind is 340,000 years old. Uh, I want to jump here forward and look at here dealing with one of the things we deal with in the class is understanding different symbols and how this land was called Egypt of the West. And many of the founding fathers or fondling fathers, as Dr. Francis Gress Wilson called them, many of them were Freemasons. And how the layout of Washington, D.C., when you read Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Kim in ancient Egypt. So here we see the Washington Monument on my right, the Washington Monument, and we see the Dr. King Monument. The Washington Monument is a very ancient symbol called a Tekken, a very ancient African symbol called a Tekken. Okay, Tekken for plural, of uh, Tekken for singular, Tekken new for plural. The Greeks call it the Greeks call it an obelisk, an obelisk, and it's a symbol of resurrection coming from the mythology of Asar or Set and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. This all deals with Africa. So when you see the Washington Monument, that's an African symbol. Okay. In ancient Kemet, there are about 1,200 Tekken new. Today, there are less than 12 that are there. All right. Um, so very quickly here, I'm going to post the link here. You can register for this 10-week online class. As soon as you register, there's bonus content you can watch. You can watch the class we did this past weekend. Uh, I teach the class on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. The class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. Even after the class is over with, you can, uh, you still have full access to the course. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course, okay? Uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. You don't have to buy any, any of the books that I show you, usually what we're talking about in class. You can also use this information with your children. I, I would say the content is PG-13, okay? I would say the content is PG-13. I don't do a lot of cursing. It's not vulgar, things like that. All right. And then we also have a bundle pack. Uh, you can register for all, all three classes I teach for $120. That's a $285 value. If you have taken any of my online classes in the past, because I've been teaching this class on and, on and off going back to 2017, and it, it, it has evolved exponentially since 2017. If you've taken any, any of my online classes in the past, Email me at AHN show at African history network.com. You get a 50% discount uh, on the courses and the bundle pack. Okay. Uh, on Sundays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the class I teach on Sundays is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. In that class, we deal with history basically from 1803, starting with the Louisiana Purchase, Purchase and the Haitian Revolution, uh, leading up to the Civil War. Um, Reconstruction era, 1865, 1877, uh, post-Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, Great Migration, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. To understand what happened to us, understand what happened to us after slavery ended, what were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament that we're in now to understand where we need to go from here. OK, so we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and also I posted the link here as well. All right, so if we go back to um, go back to the presentation here, this uh, my presentation. So this shows you the African presence even here in the United States of America, and there's numerous examples of this. We have to become history detectives so we can understand how to decode these symbols, okay, which reconnect us back to African history and culture. They reconnect us back to who we are. Here are three uh, examples of uh, Tekkenu. Tekkenu for plural. Um, or what the Greeks call obelisks. The, uh, we see the one on, on my left 
is for, is in London, uh, London, England. The one in the middle is in New York City. And the one on the right is in Paris, France, because they've been taken to different parts of the world. It's, it's theft of African culture. All right. Now, ancient Egyptians call Abeles Tekkenu. You'll see different spellings for Tekkenu. And they were all used to tell uh, the time in the past. Their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say the obelisk represented immortality and eternity, and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Currently, Cleopatra's Needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks, or Tekkenu, one in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. The, uh, the, the Tekkenu or obelisks in New York and London are carved out of red granite from the uh, quarries of Aswan, uh, a major source of stone for Egyptian an an antiquities. The two obelisks or Tekkenu were commissioned by Nesubiti or Pharaoh Thutmos III for the Temple of, of the Sun in Heliopolis near modern-day Cairo, Egypt, with each weighing about 224 tons and 68 feet tall. There's a good article uh, that we've posted on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, from facetofaceafrica.com called Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, and Paris. This article is from May 17th, 2022 it's a really good article that goes through and breaks this history down all we see once again this was egypt of the west where, where we are in, here in the united states our our african history is all around us we have to understand our history to be able to decode it and, and understand when we see these symbols this reconnects us to our african self And that comes from that the Tekken comes from the story of Asara Aset and Heru, also known as the first holy trinity. This may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. And if you read uh Nile Valley Contributions of Civilization. By Tony Browder, or you read uh, Christianity Before Christ. I'm digging for some of my books here because I have two bookshelves behind me and stacks of books next to me, and uh, hundreds of articles next to me as well. If you read uh, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, or Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, also by Browder, or even this book right here, Ancient Egypt by Lorna Oaks and Lucia Galen or Galen this book breaks all this history down this is one of the books we use as reference in the class okay it's a full color book I got it for $9.99 at was it Barnes and Noble I think they were going out of business one here in Gross Point Michigan suburb of Detroit but you can get this online Fantastic book, ton of information in there. Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson is another book we use in the class. Some of this information may go outside the circumference of your own awareness. Just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. I finally got a new copy of Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. I was at the One Africa Power and Unity Conference here in Detroit that uh, Brother Taiki Grant and Sister Felicia uh, organized, and I was speaking there also, uh, April 30th and May 1st, 2022. And uh, there's a vendor next to me, Brother Haki from uh, Baltimore. So I finally bought the book, because this is my original book from 1994, November 1990, actually November 2nd, 1994, I got this, I was, uh, 
finishing up my bachelor bachelor's degree at Wayne State University. So this book is beat up and it's falling apart and everything. And half the book is is highlighted. All this I had to get a new copy of the book. So I said, let me get that book, brother Haki. So this is <laughs> this book right here will blow your mind. Now, Brooke Browder's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him a number of times. So, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting and social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. I'm battling allergies. Okay, this is a bad allergy season. I'm allergic to pollen. Uh, this is a bad allergy season, so I'm, I'm fighting that at the same time. But if we continue, okay, and... Um, we have the link here so you can register for this class. As soon as you register, there's bonus content that you can start watching. You can join us in class on Saturday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So there were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu, um built in ancient Kemet, but only about a dozen, actually less than a dozen, are found in Kemet in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and, and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar, who the Greeks called Osiris. Okay. And this is page uh, 17 of Egypt on the Potomac. By Tony Grotto, which is another fantastic book as well. And I've read that uh, uh, book a few times also. It's only about 70 pages, but it's a powerful book, this one here. This is another book we use as reference in the class. Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Okay. And I need to break down, get a, a new copy of the book because pages are falling out. Pages are falling out of this one also. So... It's time to get a new copy of the book. All right. But this is a this is a powerful book. The, the premise of this book, it deals with how see pages are falling out. <laughs> it deals with how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Kemet. The layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Kemet. Because once again, the founding fathers, 56 of the uh, 56, 50, uh, uh, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. OK, and they laid out this land here, uh, Washington, D.C. This was supposed to be Egypt of the West. OK, Egypt of the West. So the word Mason is derived from the latin words mass and son mass and son mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light which is a metaphor for the sun which symbolizes knowledge it's a metaphor for the sun which symbolizes knowledge now one of the ways that europeans attack african cosmology in our spiritual systems is by belittling Africans and saying Africans worship the sun and thought the sun was God. The S-U-N. No, we didn't think the sun was God. We saw the sun as a symbol of the omnipresence of the creator. Because the sun is wherever you are in the world basically at some point you can see the sun some point in the day or week or something like that you can see the sun the sun goes around we, we know as the earth rotates rotates on its axis right eventually you're going to see the sun and all living things need the sun to live so we saw the sun as a symbol of the omnipresence of the creator we didn't think the sun was god OK, but Europeans were trying to uh, explain African cosmology and African spiritual systems and, and, and didn't have a really a framework, a foundation to understand. it. So the word Mason 
is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modified or modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So even today, if you watch cartoons and the cartoon character Doc, Doc McStuffins or it could be uh, Door to Explore or uh, Paw Patrol, little dogs on Paw Patrol, what have you. They have an idea. A light bulb goes off over their head, right? Or when you were a kid, you watched Tom and Jerry or Mickey Mouse or Mighty Mouse or whatever cartoons you watched, right? The cartoon character gets an idea, Woody Woodpecker or what have you, Chili Willy, right? <laughs> and a light bulb goes off over their head. So, and it's saying they have a bright idea. So they're associating light with knowledge. Even the term bright idea, bright as in lucid, as in light, you're associating light with knowledge. If you have a child that is not smart, right? You say you may say that's a dim, a dim-witted child, lack of light, or very little light. OK, so this is ancient. Um, read pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Now, many Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning, houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason, child of light, is a direct reference to the highest degree of the ancient Kemetic education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction, just a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprise the ancient Kemetic system of education, or you hear referred to as the ancient Kemetic mystery system or ancient Egyptian mystery system. Yet with less than 10% of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. So they learned less than 10% of what the ancient Africans knew. The ancient Africans, they were dealing with 360 degrees of knowledge. In Freemasonry, the highest level is the 33, is 33 degrees. Okay. And then also the concept of going to an institution of higher learning, okay, and getting your credentials in a series of steps or degrees comes out of the ancient Kemetic mystery system and the education system. So you go to college and you get an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, PhD, philosophy degree, etc. You get your credentials in the series of degrees. This is where this comes from. This comes from us. Okay. The, and, and, and African people, and, and when, when you deal with the history of the Moors going into Europe, the Moors take the take the teachings from ancient Kemet, from the Nile Valley region of Africa. They take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe and bring Europe out of the dark ages. This is what uh, they break down, those who wrote the essays, in golden age of the more this is uh what they break down in this book okay one of the best books dealing with the history of the moors edited by dr ivan van Sur for edited by dr ivan van sertima you have essays in here from dr jose pimenta bay who's one of the uh, baddest scholars of the history of the history of the moors you have renoko rashidi who's ancestor now jan karu dr john g jackson dr chandler who i've interviewed a couple times in the past this is a this book right here is a fantastic book. Uh, one of the first people I heard talk about this book was Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. And then also uh, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, because I interviewed uh, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who used to teach. He used to teach at uh, 
Temple University in Philadelphia. He used to teach classes on the history of the Moors. Then he went to Berea, Berea College in Kentucky. And I interviewed, uh, he was one of my first interviews I did back in 2010 on the African History Network show. Now, Berea College is where Dr. Uh, Carter G. Woodson got his undergraduate degree from, okay? His first undergraduate degree, his second undergraduate degree he, he got from uh, uh, in Chicago, okay? But the first one he got from uh, Berea College in, in Kentucky. Okay, so let's continue. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? Who still needs to register for this 10-week online class I teach? Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We deal with this history chronologically. And then when we look at uh, Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and Heru being born of a virgin birth on December 25th to the virgin Aset, from that, we get the worship of the Black Madonna and Child, which was worshipped all throughout Europe. The Black Madonna and Child was worshipped all throughout Europe. Europeans were basically worshipping African people. When you, uh, another book we use in the class, this one here from uh, Renoko Rashidi. And we know we lost Renoko uh, August 2nd, 2021. He passed away. He's an ancestor now. Renoko was a friend of mine. I interviewed him, I think, about six times. This book right here, Renoko was a brilliant, he, he was a world traveler, traveled to about over 125 islands and countries. He had a personal photographic library for something like 35,000, 40,000 uh, photographs he's taken himself. So he would have those photographs in his books. This is one of the books, one of his books, we use this in our class, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe, prefaced by Robin Walker, okay? Robin Walker, another brilliant scholar. Robin Walker's so bad. This brother wrote this book right here. Robin Walker wrote When We Rule. Oh my, this book right here. Robin Walker is also in the fourth installment of the Hidden Colors documentary. Okay, I've got to interview Robin Walker. We're Facebook friends. We've talked through Facebook a few times. I have this book and a couple of his other books. He's, he's, he's uh, in the UK. Brilliant, brilliant historian. Um, and the introduction of this book here is about Renoko Rashidi. Okay. But if we look here, um, page 90 and 91, Renoko shows you, these are photographs he took. He shows you the statues of the black Madonna and child in Europe that are still there today. This deals with, and, and they were worshiping the Black Madonna and Child, even before the Moors go in in 711 AD. And that comes from Asar, Aset, and Heru, who come, come from African cosmology, African mythology, out of ancient Kemet, and these were African, these were Africans as well. This one is in Switzerland, okay? This Black Madonna and Child here is in Switzerland. We see this one here, Our Lady of Jasnagora, uh saskatchewan saskatchewan poland this is in poland right here this is in switzerland the black virgin of madrid spain okay this is in spain this one here is in luxon uh luxembourg city luxembourg black virgin and child statue in saint john's church they were worshiping African people. This, this page 90, page 91, coat of arms of Pope Benedict the 16th with the head of a Moorish king on his coat of arms. Because you will see this when you study the coat of arms of a lot of the royalty in Europe, things like this, they would have an African Moors head on their coat of arms to note that they had some type of Moorish ancestry. This flag right here is the national flag of Sardinia, which is a, an Italian island. It has the, the four Moors heads on it because the Moors were in Sardinia and it took a monumental effort to defeat them. OK, so this I mean, this is a fantastic book right here. 
hear so much in this book. Okay, Black Star, the African presence in early Europe. Once again, you don't have to buy any of the books or feel obligated to buy any books to follow along in class, but we just use them as reference. You can buy them, of course. You can um, check with your local African American bookstores, things like this. Because as of now, I don't I don't sell any of the books. I have my DVD, my, my own DVD lectures and things like that. We sell at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and digital downloads of my of my lectures. But as of right now, I don't sell any books. Okay, so we go from Osset and Heru, Heru being born on December 25th to the Virgin Osset, to the Black Madonna child, to the decolorized version of the white Mary and Jesus. Now, the letter J wasn't created until 1630 AD, okay, early 17th century. And the letter J is derived from the letter I. When you look at the word Jesus in the dictionary, you study the etymology of the word Jesus. It takes you back to Yeshua with a Y, okay? Because the letter J didn't exist. It goes back to Yeshua, which is Hebrew. Uh, so we have the decolorized version. And what happens is as Europeans come out of the Dark Ages uh, and, and you go to the, the 1400s, and as they start to circumnavigate the globe, as they start to conquer people's lands, okay, as they start to extract mineral wealth from people's lands and build Europe back up because Europe was, was devastated by the uh, the Black Death, the bubonic plague. They were dealing with civil war and things like this. As they start to uh, rebuild, as you have a rise in the European phenotype, as you have a rise in the European phenotype, so as you have a rise in European powers, you start having a rise in the European phenotype in their dominance. And a lot of these various figures, various mythological figures, uh, religious figures, things like this, that were African, get reinterpreted as European. So Michelangelo pays the Sistine Chapel. And he uses his aunt and uncle as the model for uh, Adam and Eve. And he paints uh, uh, God as European and paints European angels, things like this. OK. Uh, when we look here. The Saturday morning TV show. In the 1970s. That I used to watch. The secrets of isis and we had the shazam and isis hour okay i still have comic books from the from the mid 1970s mid to late 1970s that advertised the shazam and isis hour so this came on 11 a.m eastern standard time saturday mornings a live action tv show it's a half hour shazam half hour isis where they show this white woman um, and she's Isis and she gets her powers from ancient Egypt. A few years ago, I watched some episodes of this show on the streaming service Hulu. Okay. I'm not sure if they're still there. I need to check because I pay Hulu each month, something like $7, but I don't watch Hulu. So I need, to, <laughs> I need to go check. When you watch the beginning of the show, it taught, it, they named some of the, uh, Netaru some of the comedic deities, Egyptian deities, Egyptian gods. And they tell you that she gets her power from ancient Egypt. But she, but they don't tell you that Isis was all set, who was an African woman. They just show this white woman with these superpowers flying through the sky, saving the world, things like this. So you just sit there. If you don't have the truth to counter the lie, you just sit there and think, oh, okay, ISIS was white. And the, the, the you know, the Egyptians were white and things like this. Okay, so we go through and look at some of the Netaru and things like this as well. And what we're going to see is with Christianity, we're going to see 
that the saints, especially the patron saints, are going to replace the Netaru because different Netaru had uh, different attributes. When we look at uh, Aset, who, who the Greeks called Isis, Aset means she of throne because who, who sat on the king, who sat on the throne in ancient Kemet was determined by the, who was matrilineal, was determined by the woman's side of the family. So it came through the womb of a woman, the woman's side of the family. But all set was associated with love and fertility. When you look at all, when you look at uh, Ma'at, Ma'at was the winged deity or Netter, who was the personification of truth, justice, righteousness, balance, harmony, order, and reciprocity. When you look at Dehuti, who the Greeks called Thoth, Dehuti represented divine articulation of speech and uh, measurement, science, things like this. Dehuti had an ibis head. When you see the different Netaru, who have uh, heads of animals, okay? Africans were not worshiping the animal. They saw themselves as part of nature and understood that the animals were part of nature, understand that nature comes from the creator and that the creator gave each animal a gift. So they're honoring the god-given gift that is in each animal and they incorporate that into their spiritual system so the huti the netter of science written measurements divine articulation of speech and medicine that's the huti with the with the head of an ibis okay the bird when you look at when you look at the judgment scene and you look at uh uh the jackal-headed deity a new uh, and poo, who the who the Greeks called Anubis, the jackal, uh, which is a canine, has discernment of judgment. It has a very keen sense of taste and smell. Okay, it has discernment, so it takes precision to balance the scales of Maat, and according to the comedic uh spiritual system when you died your heart was weighed against the feather of ma'at if you lived your life correctly based upon the 42 admonitions of ma'at or the uh, uh 42 negative confessions of ma'at where the 10 commandments come from your heart would be lighter than a feather okay if you didn't live your life correctly then the devourer animal that's right here next to and poo would devour you okay but it takes precision to balance the scales. So we are honoring the gift of discernment and judgment that and precision that the creator gives the jackal. We're not honor, we're not worshiping the jackal. Okay. Even when you when you look at uh uh Heru. Heru uh, has the, in the adult form, Heru has the head of a falcon, okay? And is looking at the, uh, the, the precision, uh, the, the, the vision of, uh, uh, that the falcon possesses, okay? And the falcon is a predator animal. The precision that the falcon has, the vision. If you look at, it's not, they weren't worshiping a falcon and saying the falcon is a deity or the falcon is god is honoring the gift that the creator gave the falcon but also if you look at yeshua or jesus if you will that was born on december 25th of a virgin birth to mary when you see Yeshua in the adult form in various paintings, sometimes you see a dove over Yeshua's head, as opposed to Yeshua having the 
head of a dove, you'll see a dove over Yeshua's head, a white, white bird, a dove. So what happens is, is that when we get, I was talking about Patriot Saints, because all this, all this history is connected in the Christianity, the spiritual system, things like this, because early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. Before you get to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the Council of Ephesus and Council of Chalcedon, things like this. Early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. A lot of early Christians believed in various types of reincarnation. Um, a lot of your early Christian saints were Africans. St. Nicholas was an African. And he gets canonized as a saint. St. Nicholas is the real life, uh, was a real life bishop who became a saint. That the mythological character, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, that the mythological character of Santa Claus is based upon. Because Santa Claus comes from the Dutch word center class, which means St. Nicholas. And we know that the Dutch bring the mythological character of uh, Father Christmas here to the U.S. in the early 1700s when you have a, a influx of Dutch coming in. But who was St. Nicholas? St. Nicholas was a Greek Orthodox bishop born in 280 Common Era or A.D. in Myra, which is modern day Turkey. He was born to uh, wealthy parents and gave away his inher inheritance to the poor. He was a patron saint to children, seamen, prostitutes, uh, you know, men like Navy men, men at sea, prostitutes, pawnbrokers, etc. Their mythological stories surrounding uh, St. Nicholas about saving, uh, I think it was three boys who were cut up, who were uh, ground up by a butcher or something like that and put into uh, barrels. Uh, there's, a, there's a book I'm looking for here, Christmas Miscellany by, I think it's Jonathan Green, which deals with uh, everything you want to know about Christmas. I have two copies of the book. One of them should be around here. But oh, this right here. Christmas Miscellany. This book right here. It talks about some of the uh, Christmas mis Miscellany about Jonathan Green. Yeah. When I was studying the history of Christmas, going back to 2012 and starting to do like lectures dealing with it, this is one of the books that I use as a source. But there's some mythology around um, St. Nicholas and how he becomes a patron saint to like prostitutes and things like this. It was one story where he saved uh, some girls from a, a life of prostitution. They break down the legends, page 40 and page 63 and 64. But the... Yeah, okay, it deals with why stockings are hung up on, on Christmas Eve, and it deals with uh, uh, him, him saving um, some girls from a life of prostitution or something like that. And he, he was also a patron saint to pawnbrokers. So patron saints... Patron saints, patron saints were, were saints who watched over different groups of people, just like the Netaru from ancient Kemet watched over different groups of people in different cities, things like this. The patron saints in, in Christianity rep replaced the Netaru. Here are a couple of pictures of uh, some old paintings of St. Nicholas. The older the painting is, the more African features St. Nicholas has. So what is a patron saint? If we look at uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, a patron saint 
is a saint to whose protection and intercession a person, society, church, place, profession, or activity is dedicated. The choice is usually made on the basis of some real or presumed relationship. For instance, St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland because he is credited with introducing Christianity there, even though there was someone who went in the year before St. Patrick. St. Patrick goes in 432 Common Era AD. Uh, uh, it's Pope Celestine the first who sends him in. Pat Patrick was a mass murderer. Okay. Patrick kills thousands of Druids, the Irishmen, thousands of Druids, and imposes Christianity uh, because the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church at the time wants to convert the Irish to uh, Christianity in Ireland. And at this time, uh, Ireland is a colony of the uh, Roman Empire. Okay. So, you know, like England, the England, um, England Empire, England, all, all that. It doesn't, we're talking about 432 AD. That doesn't exist then. So you're dealing with the Roman Empire. Um, but kept, but he killed thousands of Druids, and the Druids were dealing with a watered-down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Okay. And that's what um and Druid in old I Irish means he who knows. The Druids were dealing with a watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. And these teachings were at odds with what Christianity was teaching. So he killed thousands of Druids and the Druids wore a helmet with a cobra on it. Okay. And the Druids were called the snake people because of the helmet with the snake on it. That they wore so when you hear the mythology of patrick driving the snakes out of ireland well there's no evidence the snakes were ever in ireland ireland is a island that has a cold climate that's not conducive to snakes living the snakes he was driving out were what were called the snake people who were the druids who were dealing with what was known as the gnosis and the gnosis was called the true knowledge and they got their knowledge in in teachings from ancient kemet Rada breaks this down on pages 193, 194, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. But there's other information on this. I've done some lectures dealing with the history of uh, St. Patrick's Day and all this and why Patrick was a mass murderer, et cetera. OK, so I don't know why African-Americans are celebrating St. Patrick's Day. That don't, that don't even make any sense. Um, let's continue here. So, you know, we talk about Queen Charlotte. So uh, well, here are a few patrons, St. Saint. Saint Maurice, who was a it was African Moor, St. Maurice of Germany, St. Patrick of Ireland, St. Nicholas of Amsterdam and Russia, St. Benedict the Moor of uh, Palermo in San Frantello, uh, Sicily. He was also called Immoto, it, which is Italian for dark skin. He was called the African and the Black. We know that Queen Charlotte Sophia, who was the wife of King George III, King George III was the king that the um, 13 colonies are revolting against during the American Revolutionary War of 1775 to uh, 1783. Um, she was of that, uh, Queen Charlotte Sophia was of African Morris ancestry on her mother's side of the family, okay? At least her mother's side of the family. Uh, she ruled over Great Britain, Ireland, and America. One of her great, one of her granddaughters, Alexandria Victoria, became Queen Victoria I. So the older the older the painting is of Queen Charlotte Sophia, who Charlottesville, uh, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia is named after, where they had the um, uh, the Unite the Right rally in uh, August of 2017. Okay, and you had the white supremacists out there trying to save a statue uh dedicated to General Robert E. Lee, and General Robert E. Lee was against Confederate monuments. OK, even ones dedicated to him. General Robert E. Lee was against Confederate monuments. Um, Charlotte, Charlottesville is named after Queen Charlotte Sophia, an African woman. So this is one of the most famous paintings of Queen Charlotte Sophia by Sir Alan Ramsey, 1762. OK, this is in the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um. Then we have center class. So I talked about 
um, St. Nicholas in center class. So center class had a sidekick named Joata Piet. Joata Piet, Black Pete. And Joata Piet was a Moor. Okay. And in one of the versions of the stories, Joata Piet it, it becomes a slave of center class, which deals with, um, it's making fun of the Moors and the Moors being defeated by Europeans. Okay. And the Moors lose control of their last stronghold in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. So, uh, you'll see the celebration in the Netherlands and Holland in like November, December each year. And they'll have parades and uh, they, they have these celebrations up to like December 5th. And they have these parades of Europeans dressed in blackface, uh, wearing Afro wigs, and uh usually have on hoop earrings and they're pretending to be Joata Piet, Black Pete. But it's really making fun of the Moors. Now, in recent years, there have there have been more and more opposition to uh these parades, and, and they say they're racist, which they are. Okay. Uh there's a good article from the Washington Post that deals with. I have a number of different articles on this. We talk about this in the class. But there's a good article here. Center class in Joie de Piet. Why a, why a holiday has me talking to my kids about racism, about blackface. Center class in Joie de Piet. Why a holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. So this is from December 4th, 2018. And they have this reenactment every year. Now, here you see a steam. Here, here you see a, a steamship with center class coming in with Europeans dressed as Joie de Piet, Black Pete on it. And they talk about here. So, uh, Joie de Piet dates back to a children's being 50. 1850 children's book okay uh, on the second saturday of november joie de piet black pete arrives in the netherlands on a steamboat from spain on a steamboat from spain okay well spain and portugal the iberian peninsula is where the moors go into in 711 a.d they arrive on a steamboat from spain along with center class Center class is Dutch, which means St. Nicholas. A tower in center class is a towering, thin, and plushly dressed figure. He's a, a, a mythological religious figure in, in the Netherlands. Hundreds of people gather to watch the steamboat arrive with Piet's dancing and waving while brass band uh music plays until center class disembarks on a white horse until center class disembarks on a white horse with the piets walking at his side to greet and offer treats to children the ritual repeats in various cities across the netherlands until december 5th the name day of saint nicholas now piet black peach what the piet is according to folklore an assistant to center class and of moorish descent traditionally since piet's first appearance in a children's book in 1850 joie de piet is portrayed as very dark as a very dark-skinned character with large red lips curly black hair and giant hoop earrings large red lips curly black hair and giant hoop earrings when piets appear in person they are portrayed as volunteers in blackface volunteers in blackface okay so read the rest of this here this also deals with the history of the moors in europe
okay if we go back quickly here to the proper presentation how's everybody doing how you all like this type of information who still needs to register for this 10 week online class as soon as you register you can start watching uh the content you can join us in class on saturdays 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch the course anytime even a year from now two years from now the full course is archived so you'll still have full access to it i teach this class on saturdays 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school we just had a new class that started up um in the last few weeks so as soon as you register you can uh, watch the class we did last weekend you can join us in class this saturday classes on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 dollars and uh you click right here to register here we do a thousands of years of history i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips we also uh, we also have a bundle pack of the classes so you get all three classes for 120 dollars it's a 285 dollar value you take in any of my online classes in the past email me at um ahn show at african history network.com ahn show at african history network.com you get a 50 percent discount on uh the courses and the bundle pack all right let's continue here um and as our as we said previously um saint nicholas was an african saint For those who just joined us saint nicholas was an african um we deal with things like just make us out this covers of some people's awareness just because you disagree with it or don't like it uh, or you know doesn't mean it's not true just means you have to do some research to understand what we're talking about um we do a why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? Because nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Yeshua or Jesus the Christ was born on December 25th. Uh, this is from a uh, book called The Life of Christ that I bought back in 2011, which talks about the relationship between uh, the winter solstice and when Christmas is celebrated. And went to Sosis deals with astronomy, all this stuff. This, this is all ancient. Another thing that we do within the class is the film Black Panther. And the film Black Panther relates to African history and culture and, and language and spiritual systems, things like this. Film Black Panther is a very, very uh, deep movie on multiple levels. The deity, the Panther deity Bast in the, in the film comes from Bastet, which is a Netaru, comes straight out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. Here's a depiction of Bastet with the head of a cat. Ancient Egyptian goddess worshipped in the form of a cat or uh, in the form of a lioness and later a cat. Goddess of warfare in Lower Kim, Lower Egypt. Goddess of war, warfare in Lower Egypt worshipped as early as the Second Dynasty. 2890 BCE before the Common Era or BC. So I've done um, some lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. I did about three months of research, uh, researching the film and the comic book. I read over 100 articles dealing with the film and the comic book. And then I read um, this book here uh, from Marvel, Black Panther, the official movie special. This is the official tie-in to the movie. So it has interviews with the cast has interviews with the director ryan coogler okay it gives background information on the character storyline things like this okay general koya the Guerrero, you know chadwick bozeman in here we know chadwick bozeman passed away angela bassett is ramonda all this stuff so to get a deep understanding of uh of the movie 
and the storylines, things like this. So then I also had to study the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book. So I read Black Panther, the ultimate guide, which gives you storylines. It breaks all this stuff down. Okay. So when Killmonger throws T'Challa off of the waterfall, the waterfall is called Warrior Falls. Warrior Falls is where the ritual combat takes place to determine who's going to send the throne of Wakanda. Okay. That comes straight out of uh, when Killmonger throws uh, T'Challa off of Warrior Falls. That comes straight out of Jungle Action comic book number six, September 1973. They, they show it. Let me see. Can I show you this? Here? They show it right here at the bottom. They show you right here at the bottom. That comes straight up. That comes straight out of the comic book. So, um, Killmonger was changed for the movie because in the comic book, Killmonger is 100% Wakandan, where in the movie, he was half Wakandan, half African American. Okay, but this is a this is a deep book here. It gave me a much better understanding of Black Panther to understand what I was seeing in the movie. So I have one lecture, it's a three hour, almost three hour lecture. Black Panther is a, a Black Panther analysis, African history, culture, uh, and Afro spirit, Afro um, Afro futurism. So. If we look at this here, when we look at some of the deities in Wakanda, they come straight out of ancient Kemet or Africa. The religion of the Wakandan people first developed during the pilgrimage to the land in their conflict with the originators the gods of wakanda formed from the heroes of humans within the tribe ascending to the status of a god these heroes became the orisha now the orisha is the name of the deities in ifa which is practiced by the yoruba in nigeria this is why i said either it's coming straight out of ancient Kemet or Africa in general. Taking the names Koku, Thoth, now Dehut, Thoth is the Greek name for Dehuti, Bast, coming from Bastet, Mujaji, Pata, which is a, a Neturu also, and Niami. The, Orisha, the Orishas origins date back to the ancient Egyptian being, beings known as the Ennead. Now, the Ennead is Greek for nine and deals with some of the early Neturu. In addition to the development of these gods, the people of Wakanda, and Wakanda is a real word also. Wakanda is in the Omaha Ponca, uh, Native American languages, and Sioux Indian means possessive secret powers, but also Wakanda is also a Bantu word as well, okay? Uh, and we see this in uh, Key Congo. Okay, so Wakanda... The Native American word and African word also. Now, when they introduced Black Panther in July 1966, I don't know if they knew it was an African word, but you you have a water park in Wisconsin called Wakanda. You have schools like in Nebraska named Wakanda. So Wakanda, we already knew, was here going back decades in this country. In addition to the development of these gods, the people of Wakanda became segmented into various cults that worship various animal gods of the area the most famous cults included the black panther cult the black panther cult and the white gorilla cult 18 tribes in total developed in the country and included the lion cult crocodile cult and hyena now what this is straight out of the black panther comic book and it is connected to african culture and spiritual systems history, things like this. Now, what are the Ennead? Okay. Ennead means group of nine in Greek. In ancient Kemet, they were called Pesjet. The nine Neturu were Autumn, which is the sun, 
Shu, which is air, tough nut, moisture, gab, earth, and nut, sky, Asar, Asar or Osiris, Oset, Isis, Seth, and Nephetis. Okay, pages two, 274 to 277 in ancient Egypt, the book I showed you here, ancient Egypt by Lorna Oaks and uh, Lucia Gollin, then also now valid contributions to civilization. But in this book here, they break down, they have a, um, they show, they have a chart which breaks down the different Neturu, the different deities in ancient Kenya. Okay. So this is just a brief overview of this 10 week online uh, class that, that I teach. Now, what is Bantu? Bantu languages are a group of some 500 languages belonging to the Bantuid uh, subgroup of the Banu Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in very large er in a very large area, including most of uh, Africa from southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent. OK, down into southern Africa. 12 Bantu languages are spoken by more than 5 million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, or Isikosa. Isikosa is the language spoken in the film Black Panther. That's a real African language, and it's, it's a Bantu language. And Zulu, Swahili or Kiswahili, okay, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca, important in both commerce and literature. So Kwanzaa, is a Bantu word. It's Kiswahili. Okay. Uh, Britannica.com has some good information there on there, a good synopsis of this. Okay. And like I said, the word Wakanda, we see this in the Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian languages. Um, this is at the Wakanda Water Park in Wisconsin, located in uh, Wakanda Park in Mimini on the shores of Lake Mimini. This group is what's left of once large uh, of once large cluster of mounds. They were submerged when Lake Memonin was created by damming uh, Red Cedar River. Out of 17 submerged mounds, 14 were excavated by archaeologists. Some of the mounds contain burials, including an individual wearing clay mask, the feature found in only two other mound sites in Wisconsin. So you can check this out, Wisconsin Mounds Wakanda Park, Parks, HTML, HTML, and memony wigovernor Then they have this historical marker, pre pre prehistoric Indian mounds, Wakanda and Mimini, uh, Wisconsin. Okay, prehistoric Indian mound. So it's a ton of information that we deal with in this class. We look, look at different African civilizations briefly. Uh, we deal with uh, the history of the Moors. This is a great article that uh Renoko Rashidi wrote the, the the Moors Light of Europe's uh Dark Age. Uh we, we look at uh, of course Tariq Ibn Ziyad, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad, who the Rock of Gibraltar is named after, uh Tariq's mountain. And he uh, goes into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD. Uh Saint Maurice as well, who became a patron saint to uh Germany, who was a Moor also. Uh, we look at the uh, why does the uh, national flag of Sardinia, which is an Italian island, and the, the French island of Corsica, why do they have Moors heads on uh, their national flags as well? Uh, and then we you, we deal with Christopher Columbus. You have to deal with Columbus because Columbus helps to uh, spread the transatlantic slave trade. Columbus is central to the spreading of the transatlantic slave trade even though we it goes back to the early 1440s with the portuguese okay and we know that columbus is conquering on behalf of the spanish crown king ferdinand and queen isabella all right but um we look at where columbus went on his four voyages he never comes to the land that we call the united states of america um areas that he goes in and conquers like hispaniola and the western third of the island of Hispaniola is where Haiti is. You know, these, these places, Jamaica and Puerto Rico, Honduras, they've never recovered for what the Spanish did to them over 500 years ago. 
okay, so we, we go through and look at uh, uh, Columbus and look at this history chronologically. And uh, and then also we look at the Asiento de Negros because the Asiento signed in 1518 by King Charles V helps to uh, spread the transatlantic slave trade, which was a license given by, given by the Spanish crown to uh, slave traders and slave trading nations to provide um, Spanish colonies with African slaves. And it, it, it was a direct voyage uh, from Africa to those colonies as opposed to having to go into Spain first. Pope in, in 1488, Pope Innocent VIII uh, accepted a gift of 100 more slaves from King Ferdinand of Spain and then distributed the slaves to various cardinals and nobles. So we go through and, and look at this history chronologically, okay? Uh, and to see what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place and uh, what exactly was the transatlantic slave trade. What was the middle passage? The leg of the triangular trade from Africa to the Americas, manufactured products such as rum, textiles, weapons, gunpowder, et cetera, was taken from uh, Europe to Africa in exchange for Africans who would become uh, slaves or, or exchange for gold and silver. These African slaves were sold in the Americas, Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera, for raw materials such as sugar, mola uh, sugar and molasses, which was turned into rum, tobacco, later on cotton, and also for fish, flour, and foodstuffs. All right, so this is just a brief overview of uh, what we cover in this uh, 10 week online course that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. All right. Uh, so you can register for this class at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Also, in the, the uh, description of this broadcast, we have the link here. You can register for it. As soon as you register, there's archive content you can start watching. Class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. You can use this information also with your children. Uh, I would say the information is PG-13. E uh, even after the course is over with, a year from now, two years from now, you still have full access. You can watch the entire class, okay? We have a bundle pack also. You can register for uh, all three classes that I teach for um, $120 is a $285 value. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com and you'll get a 50% discount. All right, so be sure to uh, follow us on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Also, if you like this type of information, you want to support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Um, and if you want to pay through Cash App, just email us. We can do that. Uh, we have the new documentary. Heavy is the Crown from the Out of Darkness series from director Amadeus Christ is available on DVD at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You get one of my lectures free with it. We also have a bundle pack on sale where you get the uh, you get the uh, documentary and four of my lectures free and enrolled in the uh, online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Listen to the African History Network show also. We just celebrated our 12th year anniversary, uh, which was on March 10th, 2010. Uh, uh, first broadcast of March 10th, 2010. So March of this year, celebrated my 12th year anniversary. We're on uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we broadcast here on Facebook and YouTube when uh, I broadcast live. But here's um, official Cash App information. Our Cash App tag is dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. When you go to it, it says Michael it shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. I'm trying to get them shut down. Uh, cash app has started an investigation because I contacted them about this. Here's our link here and the yellow donate button for PayPal also. Okay. So you support us through uh, cash app and PayPal. Hopefully you like this type of information. Be sure to register for an online class. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time, and uh, we'll see you in class. All right, peace.